Hello, my name is Andrea Kalin. I'm the president of the New England Conservatory, and it's my great privilege to welcome you today to our NEC Summer Series. Uh, I am very fortunate today to be joined with two um, quite extraordinary individuals and two of our esteemed NEC faculty, Kim Kashkashian, uh, who's been teaching viola and chamber music at NEC since 2000, um, and also is the artistic director and founder of Music for Food, and Lucy Chapman, uh, also uh, a wonderful member of our, of our string faculty, violin faculty, and actually who was the chair of um, the string faculty for many years. So thank you to you both for joining me. I'm really delighted to be able to talk with you today. Thanks, Andrea. Thank you. So you two have been doing some really, um, uh, really incredible work around the issues of health and wellness. And these were important issues for musicians before COVID-19. Um, and they are really important issues for our students and for all of our musical um, community now. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the work that you've been doing over the past few months relative to health and wellness. And maybe Lucy, we'll start with you. Thank you, Andrea. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Kim and I have been on a committee that's called the Health and Wellness uh, Committee, looking at issues of of this sort throughout the school. And it brought together a lot of people who had different views, different ideas for going forward and in, for improving, um, improving the wellness of our students basically, but also working out in the community um, with the health community of Boston. And so, and a lot of the work that Tanya Maggi's done um, out in the community. So we've been, we've had our own little parts to play, but also we've been part of the community, the committee that has done a lot of more general work. Great. Kim, would you like to talk a little bit more? Sure. Well, we focused on various areas where we feel um, a health and wellness component um, could be identified as a real viable and living organism in the school environment. And one of those areas, of course, is performance health. And that involves um, body work, injury prevention, and anxiety for performance itself. So it's a psychology point, there's a body point, and um, working to build up um, enough information that would be available to all our students so that they could experiment with these things and hopefully prevent bodily injury, um, professional-based body injury, and also maybe gain some insights into how playing an instrument actually fits into the bigger world of physicality. And at the same time, um, performance anxiety how that fits into their bigger world. It's not just about what happens when you're on stage, but how do you handle interactions? How do you handle any kind of stress? So that's one area that we were working very hard to try to formulate some things that could be made available to all the students all the time. Another um, very important area is to um, make sure that the sense of preserving our hearing, physical hearing, is um, really taken seriously so that orchestra musicians are also aware of what they can do to prevent injury from s sitting maybe right in front of the trombone section, for example. Um, so we do have a nurse and she's very involved in this aspect um, for singers and who need their ears in a different way than we do, and for all of us who need to preserve. Um, another thing that we were discussing and is probably not going to be on the table this year because of the challenges of COVID are having a dedicated space. So a real identity and space, which in the school would be called the health and wellness space where all of this could take place, Tai Chi classes, um, Alexander Technique classes, Feldenkrais classes, and finding a time 
when enough students could participate in these classes. That's another big challenge, which is going to look very different this year than in other years. Right, it may present more opportunities actually for us since everything is shifting around a little bit so we can be a bit more flexible. I'm curious, um, you know, what your what the awareness of your students are it is coming into this, how aware they are of these issues, you know, particularly if we think about performance anxiety, that's, you know, something that I think we often uh, feel like we need to hide um, or sort of not not be open about and sort of tamp down. And so I'm curious, um, uh, in the in the pre COVID days, you know, how how aware your students were of the physicality of their work and the issues around that and the importance of wellness, um, both physical and mental, and then also how that might have changed um, in this in this COVID moment. You want to take that Lucy or shall I? Well, I will say, first of all, that over the 20 years that I taught at NEC, my general view was that students awareness as a whole grew and developed and the faculty perhaps too but i think it happened in the general world too where people became more aware it it was no longer cool to say now ah, you got pain well take some pills yeah 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 it'll be fine just ignore it that's not accepted anymore and i'm glad it's not people really work with it and i find that the students are quite aware now when they have problems. I'm sure some maybe are in denial, but I think there's a, a much more open uh, speed way of talking about it and thinking about it. And the resources they have at NEC are much better than they were 20 years ago. There's just no comparison. I, and I'm thrilled with that. I always think we can do more. We can consolidate it more. We can make sure people know about what's there. I, that's part of it. It's information about what's there. Do people know? Um, on the other hand, right now, I'm curious to see what students are doing because I think um, some of them are pent up and not getting enough exercise in general. Some of them have a lot more stress about their career than they did last year because of COVID. And some of them might be saying, why should I bother about being nervous if I play that E flat too sharp? There are people dying in this world. I should just go out and learn what I have. So we could work different ways. Right. And are you finding, Kim, are you finding that your students in this online environment are over practicing or, you know, is that causing different sorts of issues? Um, well, let me backpedal just a, a few steps and say that I think sure. more and more of the studio teachers, which is the origin of student knowledge in the school, are aware of a holistic approach, let's say, to enjoying the craft of playing the instrument, the art of playing the instrument and of being in contact with the composer and the audience, and also how to handle those things. I think it's, there's a more, um, generally holistic approach. And I also agree with Lucy that one of the most important things that we could do as an NEC community is to make sure that that information is very, very visibly shared, where it might not already be shared. Um, that having been said, my class is extremely aware of the physicality of playing and how to prevent injury. And even though some of them will deny when they're getting sore, um, but it's, uh, they know because it's part of the culture of my studio that a good body foundation is extremely important and that it actually, how you use your body affects how your maybe not so expensive violin or viola or cello might sound, that the body is part of the resonance chamber. And if, if that were to become a universal knowledge, then it would not be considered um, a negative thing or something to be ashamed of if you have a pain, because you would know that if you could fix it, you would sound better. Right, right. So it's so, tied to the impact of artistry, right. Yeah. And you asked me if my students are over practicing. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's quite a incredible range of how everybody's handling 
the relative isolation. Some of them are with their families. Some of them are truly alone. Um, and I don't have anyone that over practices because they know better uh, in my studio. They just <laughs> they wouldn't. <laughs> they wouldn't do it. <laughs> I, I will, I will. Even from a distance, yeah, they yeah, would not do it. Yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. But I, I did suggest a certain kind of a patterning of their days to them, which I think is good for anyone, especially someone who's alone. Um, I have a couple of students who are actually quite isolated still. And having a pattern to your day, to your week, to your month, having sh very short-term goals for the day, like I am going to practice three hours and I am going to study whatever it is, fill in the blank for two hours. And I am going to get some aerobics, even if it means jumping up and down in, in my tiny little room um, every day. And at the end of the week, I'm going to be able to play this. And at the end of the month, I'm going to be able to play this. And before I go back to school, I plan to have this, this, and this ready. So those kinds of goals you, we can give our students and ourselves, actually. I need them too. Um, without concerts, we all need substitute goals. But I do believe we all right. need goals. Yeah. yeah, so what you've really, I'm really struck as you talk about that, that it really is that holistic approach, right? So it's not the sort of moment of now I'm being physically well and I'm dealing with my sort of wellness and now I'm dealing with my practicing or, you know, preparation that the goal setting is very tied to the wellness, is very tied to the artistic results and, and aspirations. And so um, as we think about moving through the summer and, and back into the fall, I'm wondering sort of how you are thinking we as an institution might better shape that holistic endeavor. Well, we're dealing with, I'm sorry, I'm jumping the gun on you. Liz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, good. Uh, I, we're dealing with sure. two, two sets of issues here. One, let's say without COVID, that what we all need to do is to um, promote through example the fact that a 25 minute attention span is known uh, neuro uh, scientifically to be the best length of time to concentrate on one thing without taking a break. So if, if we were all to do that by example and all classes were to say, okay, it's been 25 minutes, stand up, stretch, turn around, sit down again. Now we'll go on. Um, that would be something that could be integrated into every ensemble rehearsal, every private lesson, and every large ensemble. Um, every class, every theory class. Um, that, that's a very important, tiny little step that doesn't cost anything except for five minutes. And it's so well worth it. And right. that, that's, that's a looking at the picture without COVID kind of suggestion. Um, and it's amazingly effective. For some reason, the biology and the chemistry work together best at that 25 minute uh, limit. So um, other things that of course could be done, and again, this is really a question of, of giving out the information. Um, every rehearsal, large ensemble rehearsal, should have the same thing incorporated into it before, in the middle, and after. The idea that um, the brain and the spirit work better if the body is relaxed and strong. Yeah. Right. I would say Hugh yeah. Wolf is very interested in this. Yeah, which is great. Orchestra director, yeah, yes, uh, he'd mentioned that to me before. It's, but it's, um, I'm struck by the sort of connection to what you, each of you said earlier, which is the importance of making this information accessible and thinking about this intentionally as part of how we we build this in. We've been thinking um, quite a bit about, you know, uh, we didn't have much preparation for moving into an online environment uh, at the end of the semester, and it was a mm -hmm a kind of quick and dirty thing, but as we think about digital teaching, the same way as we think about performing in an online stage, you know, it's really struck me that these are different audiences, different opportunities, different time spans. Um, 
and uh, and we can teach in different ways and perform in different ways for a different environment. And so, um, so what you're really describing is is that that same kind of shorter attention, really thinking about how our bodies can and minds can sort of connect for a period of time and building in those breaks. Um, you did some you did some work over the the course of the semester online and it seems like physical wellness and particularly the tai chi and some of these other courses would not be things would not be easy things to do and adjusting students um playing stances to make sure that they're physically well that's got to be a little bit more challenging in a in a digital environment i'm wondering if you could talk about that how you overcame those challenges well missing the visceral both sonically in terms of what we're hearing yeah. and what we're right. able to put out and the visceral response of the audience or being able to touch our students and help them to feel i mean my teacher was always all over us and and she taught us vibrato by moving on our arms and it, mm -hmm. it was extremely feel oriented and we're having to use a lot of metaphor uh, and it again, it works better with some students than with others. Some who can take it a metaphor and actually embody it more easily and others for whom it takes maybe three or four different tries and going around the bush a few different ways. So it's it's a very different way of teaching. And one thing I want to say, which is maybe politically incorrect, I hope we don't get used to it. I hope we don't get used to what's missing because that thing yeah. that's missing both in personal contact and in in the visceral world is so powerful and absolutely we we need to remember what it was yeah i, I agree with you fully it's uh i think it's been very clear what technology can do for us and the flexibility that it can give us and some great and i think we can do it better the same way that we've learned to do everything better but we also, that human connection and the immediacy of that is just so critical. Um, uh, something I miss very much. I miss hearing, hearing the sounds of the work, you know, so. Um, in your own practice and in your own lives as, as artists, how, what kinds of practices and things have you found most impactful in, in creating this sense of, sorry, sense of wellness um, yourself? Well, I will say for me, it, it's um, having, a practice of regular, uh, I don't do a big practice like Kim does, of, uh, but I do a regular meditation and a regular um, exercise program that I now do digitally. I mean, I do it online. I can do it by myself too, but it does help to do it with friends. Um, it does help to do it with other people. It, it's a little easier to get up in the morning when you know you're you're joining a group of people that are all going to get up and exercise together and and then sit and calm themselves and I find that that is very important. I will say the first time I started meditating, the very first time it was because I had performed the first Bartok Quartet and we had a lot of long slow notes and my bow was shaking. <laughs> That was it. That was the only reason I started meditating, you know, 48 years ago. Um, You're and, such a musician, motivated <laughs> by the piece. <laughs> that was the only, and I found, oh, this gives me a technique that actually slows down my heartbeat and slows down my breath. And therefore, when I get that, and I'm, I have been for much of my life a very hyper person, and before a concert, <laughs> you know, then I can do this and it slows things down and often just to normal. And I tell you, for a performer, that makes a big difference. And I tested it out once by accident because I went to my doctor for a checkup and they always take me in and do my blood pressure. I don't have high blood pressure, but you know, at this time, I sat in the chair and the nurse went off and was called off to do something else. So while she was gone, I thought, oh, I'll just sit here and meditate. And I did this exercise. And I didn't think about the fact that this really does slow down your, you know, slow everything down. But she came back and she took my blood pressure and she said, are you feeling okay? 
<laughs> your blood pressure is so low. And I went, ah, uh, oh, no, 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 no. I think I'm okay. And I asked the doctor, she said, if you're not fainting, then you're probably okay. But I realized it really did work. And yeah. so in terms of right. performance anxiety, I, I'd say give it a try, even if it's the most simple <laughs> breathing exercise. Yeah. That's fantastic. Kim, how about you? Well, I, it, it's a similar, it's a parallel journey. Um, I was at Marlboro and I was performing a piece that started with a long, slow viola solo. <laughs> and we were in the dining hall, the informal venue, and I could sense Mr. Serkin, Rudolf Serkin, diagonally behind me, <laughs> seeing my back. And oh my goodness, my bow was shaking so badly. And I promised myself I had to solve the problem. And my solution was a little different, but they're related because I started doing martial arts that September. Uh -huh. And the bottom line, it's the same thing because you have to ground yourself. Right. You're, you're sending energy in a, um, you're using your energy consciously and sending it to somewhere where it's more powerful. And, and I, think, I think maybe that's uh, something that the two disciplines could be said to share in certain ways. Yes. Uh, so as part of the aspiration um, it, for our students to give them access to different sorts of mechanisms so they can sort of find the thing that clicks with them, is it sort of yeah. a matter of like find what works for you? Is that, Absolutely. yeah? Absolutely. We should, we should be able to offer something like um, um, AT, which is very specific, like or dance. something like Tai Chi, which is a little more, you know, touchy-feely mentally. You have to imagine the breathing and the moving together and grounding yourself. And we have to think that there are those like Lucy who do best actually sitting still. That for me would be impossible. I would not get low blood pressure by, <laughs> by sitting still. I'm, I'm kind of with you on that one. It sort of shifts you know, it up a little I, bit. I get low blood pressure by doing my kicks and punches. <laughs> whatever works. Is what, there, whatever is works. There, <laughs> have you learned any, have you learned something from your students that surprised you that has been a sort of really effective technique that, that has shocked you? Or not, you know, we wouldn't have hit. I had a student get into boxing, and I thought, a boxing for a violinist? What a terrible thing. It helped her so much. It got her out of a very difficult time, just, and she'd come in, and she was, she was suddenly uh, letting go her energy. She went from boxing to some other stuff, too, and, but I, I, that surprised me. I, and I, I say now, hey, if it works, you do it. And, and she didn't hurt her hands. Yeah. Oh, I've had a couple of students who have surprised me by using the visual arts to gain access to their um, sonic fantasies for music. Yeah, and also to help them understand. I've got one student now who just recently graduated and he's sending me the paintings that he's doing every week. Wow. And because they're helping him to process what's going on in this country and what his future might be. And it's, it's really amazing how that's working for him. Yeah. That's incredible. So as we think about our new students coming in, in the fall, so the returning students have had the, the, the great luxury of working with you, uh, both of you. Um, and your colleagues, but for the new students coming in, you know, they have, they've just graduated from high school at a very extraordinary time. They've now had a summer of ambiguity and they're coming into, um, if college is unknown at the best of times, it's certainly unknown in this moment. And so, um, uh, as you can imagine, their sort of growing anxiety and also um, the desire to develop into the, the great musicians, even, you know, the best musicians they can possibly be. What kind of advice would you offer them as to how they might think about using the summer to prepare for that? I would say if they sure. don't have 
if they don't already have some regular form of physical exercise, that they start trying to find one that works for them. Because everybody who, who's a professional in this field says the only kind of exercise that works is one that you do. That's if true. You right, right, do it, right, if yeah. you don't like it and you don't do it because you don't like it, it, it really... You're you not going to do it, yeah. Right. So, so I would say if they don't have something, um, try to find something. And then when they get to Boston, it's going to be different this year. They're not going to be looking around for yoga studios, you know, uh, outside NEC. They're not going to, they're really going to be doing things more on campus or in their door or in their dorm room or in their apartment. Mm -hmm. And so I, well, freshmen in the dorm room. Um, and I think that they should think about finding something that they can do there. I do. It, that would help. So I'm going to throw out a, a thought. I don't know what the population of the dorm is going to be like, and I don't know what the dining area is going to be used for between meals or if it's being used at all. But that could be a space for um, freshman meetings uh, led by some form of exercise so that it's it's there. They're walking out of their rooms. They're walking to class and they see, oh, this is here. I could do it. That goes along with what Lucy just said. You know, yes. sometimes, right. yeah. I mean, keeping six foot distance is, you know, you'd have to count it out. You'd have to measure it out. Um, but making something visible and available and having them know that now that's a great idea. Well, we, yeah, that's a great, we can certainly, certainly look at that. We have dots. I was in the building yesterday for the first time in almost four months. I guess it was four months. Uh, mm -hmm. and we have dots on the floor now, so <laughs> we will, we yeah. will be able to keep everybody safe and distance. Um, but the visibility of it, just sort of being invited into it is what I'm hearing. Yeah, that it's part of the culture. Right. And if they right. see some staff and some faculty also taking part, boy, that would really help. Well, yeah. I shall be hitting you up for that. <laughs> the other, the other <laughs> Even on a video of, screen. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that seems to be a challenge for every freshman incoming is understanding how to handle time yes. in the day. How do you divide your time? And that's something that they could start to practice today by making a chart, an hourly chart, a weekly chart, a monthly chart, and putting goals and first just tracking, well, what am I actually doing? Yeah. Well, those are both really, really great and tangible bits of advice, um, advice actually that I will attempt to take myself, I think, in preparing. <laughs> <laughs> so, because this is an ongoing process of lifelong learning, I think, with this uh, being in this space um, and, and being very mindful of this as part of our work. One of the things I've liked, I've thought about and suggested in our health and wellness work is really inviting the students in to be um, their own um, examiners, their own researchers about how they work best. Mm -hmm. And to say, look, okay, you want to try this? Come try it for a while and we will help give you a structure. Let's plan this structure. You can plan it, but let's, let's have it planned. We'll give you, you can do this class at a certain time and try it out for a while and see how it works. Give us the feedback too, but really engage them in seeing, does it work for you to practice in the morning? Does mm -hmm. it work for right. you? But, but consciously try it because I find it, it's very easy for days and weeks and months to go by before you've noticed that your system isn't working that well. And I think if you're yeah. engaged consciously in yeah. assessing after a week, did it work? I think that you're more likely to say, I'll try this this week. Mm -hmm. That's great. Sort of active listening to yourself and permission mm -hmm. to try new things. That's really terrific. Well, I, I really want to thank you both for taking the time today to talk with, with me about this. I'm really excited about this work. Um, as you mentioned, the 
the Center for Musical Health and Wellness. And as the committee goes forward, I know we're really looking at these three areas, sort of music and community health, uh, and including things like creative aging and music and healing spaces. And that, um, as you mentioned, Lucy has a lot to do with Tanya Maggi's work with community partnerships and performances. Um, and then, of course, what you've really been talking about today, which is just the physical, um, you know, healthy musicians and performance wellness, right, in all of its um, capacities. Um, and then um, a kind of new area for us that we'll be looking at is really performance psychology and how we um, can think about the research that goes along with this, as well as things like performance anxiety, um, the practice as it ties to health and wellness, but also um, some of the research that goes with that. So I am deeply grateful to you both for being, uh, and really forging these conversations, just being, like, driving them and, and being such linchpins in them um, and getting us institutionally to think about this work because it's really so important as we imagine how our musicians, our young musicians are going to have long lives that they can't even imagine yet and how we prepare them for it holistically. Uh, and of course, both of you are just unbelievable exemplars of that. We all aspire to be either one of you. So thank you for thank you for all of your expertise and energy and, and care in this. Um, and I will look forward to seeing you uh, in the fall, socially distanced, but in the buildings nonetheless. And uh, I hope that you all take care. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Andreas. Stay safe. Thanks. Yeah. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye.